Kanyan. I'm the director of the U.S. Working Center for the Environment. We were fortunate enough for the last month to have Arthur Delmanjian with us. Arthur is a transportation engineer, traffic engineer specifically, uh, at the uh, Quebec Ministry of Transportation in Canada. And uh, he comes with a substantial academic and also uh, practical experience in transportation planning. Uh, we, uh, when we initially talked to, uh, to him, uh, his, uh, the idea for his internship visit was to, um, to come spend one month and try to organize our thinking about uh, how to integrate cycling in, as an alternative mode of transport into Yerevan's transportation infrastructure. Um, so uh, he spent done quite a bit of uh, research, background research, what has been done. He'll present some of that result, but of course uh, that is not a project that can be done in one month. But at least he will help us kind of think, organize our thinking around how you introduce cycling as an alternative mode of transport. Cycling that has the adequate infrastructure, that is safe, uh, and, um, and also has a, a component of education in it that increases safety, increases user uh, um, uh, demand, and so on and so forth. Uh, but the first half, I think his background in, uh, in transportation engineering, especially the integration of IT and in transportation planning and management, I think should be of interest to a larger audience. We have a computer science program uh, and computational science program. I think a lot of these fields are merging or intersecting with each other. And I think some of the stuff he'll present will no doubt be interesting to, to all of us. So with that, Arthur, thank you very much for spending a month with us, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. I had a great time here. I'm going back tomorrow, and it's sort of hard to believe. Yeah, crying. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you everyone for being here. So like Arden mentioned, we're going to talk about two subjects today, emerging trends in transportation engineering, and then a quick uh, overview of planning for Yerevan to be a cycling city. Uh, this picture on the cover is from myyerevan.am and it was, uh, it was an event organized at some point to cycle from uh, Yerevan to Erebuni. And just by looking at the picture, someone mentioned they don't, they're not wearing helmets, which is true. But when I look at the picture, I see, I don't know, I see this feel that cycling is a good thing in Yerevan. So hopefully one day it will be well organized and we'll have a lot of cycling. So let's get into it. Part one, we'll talk about uh, evolution of transportation engineering and the nexus of the IT sector and the computer science sector. And I'll give a few examples of how this happens. And then I'll go on to the cycling part of the presentation. Talk about an analytic uh, framework for bicycle planning, overview of uh, design guidelines from around the world, and how we can apply this to Yale. And I'll finish with some recommendations for future projects. So, here I have a, a flowchart of, uh, a simplified flowchart of transportation planning. So on the left side we have the needs, and towards the center we get into the planning phase, and at the right side we have the final product. But what I want to focus on today is the data part, which is what is revolutionizing the civil engineering field, the transportation engineering field. So like the internet revolutionized shopping, developments in the technology sector and computer science are changing the way we perceive data, collect data, store data, treat and visualize the data. So I've divided data into three components, users, privacy and spatial context, which is the biggest uh, novelty. So users, in the sense that it's not only authorities that use data anymore, a lot of governments share their data, so developers or other people can use them. Privacy, because privacy used to be a concern, it still is, but people don't realize that their privacy has been infringed already. And spatial context is now everything is location-based. Absolutely everything has coordinates, whether it's projected XY or GPS coordinates, even on Facebook when we go shopping, we check in, etc. That's a form of data. 
So I'll, I'll give a quick evolution of data collection for transportation engineering. Over here we have hand counts, like they used to do back in the day. Then we moved on to, well we call this a, a Jamar, which is a company that makes it, it's a clicker for counting intersections. You see all the approaches are here. And then a good example is the loop detector, which is a coil metal that we put underneath the pavement. And when a car passes over it, it sends a, it sends a bomb, electrical signal, and that counts the car. And you need one for each lane. And these things are often, now they might be centralized, where you can go get the data remotely, but most of the time they're not. Then we move on to laser sensors, which is pretty new. So this thing right here, if it's a laser that bounces back from the cars and it will count all the lanes at once and even classify the vehicles and gets their speed. And now we have Bluetooth counters, which is this device here, which is also solar powered. A lot of devices are now solar powered, so that's another uh, advancement in technology. So for example, if these two cars have a Bluetooth device in it, a phone or something else. When car A and B pass by number one, number one being one of these machines, the machine will get their address, the MAC address of the device, and then they will pass again from, a, let's say, a second point. So that way you get a vehicle count, you know where the vehicles are going, which is very valuable information, and you can get travel time data and speed data, for example. And now, this is where the computer part comes in. Now a lot of universities are focusing on computer vision, which sort of takes away the, the human component or the effort to do car counting or data collection. So on, on this part of the screen, we see the green areas, which are entry zones. Vehicles are detected by the video when they enter the green zone and they exit the, the red zones. It's the same idea here. These two lines are probably used for calibration at first, to calibrate the, the video, and then they do counting. Here we show that it could be applied to pedestrians and you can even track their uh, uh, trajectory. Uh, I didn't find a video that tracks, that showed tracking of trajectory for cars, but it's, it's useful information, so I tried to substitute that information with this picture of a, a, a snowbank here, which is basically showing with the green lines that this area of the road is not being used. So snow is an indicator of how we can construct safer intersections, let's say. On the pets one, what is the, how do you use that? How do you use it? Yeah. You mentioned the accident projections. Yeah, so I want to make the connection. For the pedestrians, I can't think of a use right now, but if we extrapolate the vehicles, so instead of the snow, if we add the trajectories of the vehicles, then we know that each the turn radius, the average turn radius for the vehicle, for the people that pass by the intersection is such. And then it's, well, there's different types of conflicts. And they could, now there's this thing called time to collision, which is instead of studying accidents, is preventing them or predicting them. So it, again, with uh, algorithms and computers, it tracks the trajectory of the vehicles and it gives the time to collision. And if these two vehicles keep going the way they are, they will collide eventually. So that's one application. Now we're gonna wanna, that was the data collection part, so now I'm gonna move into data management. Now data should be stored in databases as opposed to free files, so let's say traffic counts, that will be impossible to find later. This, the spatial component should be included at all times. Instead of describing the you can always describe, I did a traffic count on the intersection of X and Y street. But that information is so easy to obtain now because every device pretty much has a GPS on it. And it should be object-oriented and relational. This means that there is a relationship between data that, could, that makes that it's easily retrievable and updatable in the future. And data is shared by authorities. And there's laws that exist that make it that governments or authorities have to share their data. So one last point I want to make is that before we start a relative reference system and now we're moving towards an absolute reference, these two should st still exist because the relative one is good for human understanding. By relative, I mean, let's say if we're talking about roads, uh, I say there's an accident or we're going to repair between mile posts 
70 and my goal is 71, let's say. But for calculation purposes, that's really difficult because uh, it's so much easier to do a canvas, an infinite canvas of coordinates. And that's good for data management. For example, GPS coordinates and geographic information systems. And here is a trend of how things changed before or until now we have very specialized software that used by select few people with very specific file file types or input types. Then we moved on to ge geographic information systems and simulators for traffic or other things. And then we saw a convergent of conversions of all these data types in cross-platform. And now everything is open source software. Software that cost used to the cost twenty thousand dollars a license are now programmed by enthusiasts for free. Uh, web interfaces, all those devices that I talked about before, required a computer programmer or someone to extract the data. Now they're all connected to web interfaces. You can connect remotely and get the data. Online map services, we use them every day. Google Maps, Bing Maps, Apple Maps. And, uh, and I want to just mention other commonly used data sources. This is where the, the privacy part comes in. Our cellular phones are used every day by uh, Google, for example. Smart cards, this is for transit systems that work with smart cards in other cities. It's very valuable information to understand where people are coming from and where they're traveling. And GPS equipped vehicles like buses and taxis, again, provide very good data. So this is just a graphic to summarize that the data that I talked about, the management and the collection, is useful for all stages of the, of the project. Planning, design, operations, and maintenance. So if it's well organized, the data, if it's well organized, you can use it at any time. And now I just want to give some quick examples. So Google Maps directions, this is, this is commonly used, we use it every day, at least for driving in Yerevan, because the transit one doesn't exist yet, because the transit agencies haven't created the files yet. And then we have bicycling. And as of very recently, I'm going to go ahead and say maybe two weeks ago, they added the elevation. So if you plan, if you plan a, a cycling trip, you can get the elevation of your route, which is useful for the other one because there's big elevation differences. Another commonly used uh, is Google Traffic. Uh, it doesn't exist for the one, but I'm sure there's a lot of people from outside here. Do you, does anyone use the Google Traffic? Do you know how it's done? Do you know how to get the data? Oh, you guys don't even see it in just one second. Mm -hmm. Cell phones. Cell phones, exactly. If you enable the location on your iPhone or Google Maps app, then Google is, uses your location. And that's how they can track travel times and such and give these colors for traffic. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm not going to show anything. I'll show one from these, this, this is an example of open data. A day in the life. What this is, is the, they took data from New York City cabs and they mapped it. So you can see, I don't know why it's moving so fast, but. So here we see the the number of people served, etc. And this is the legend here. This is so these are different people traveling? It's the same cap? One cap. This is one cap. A one cap. But I, if, when you press you can load a different one, for example. So this, is, this shows what a cap does in one day. So, but that's when it picks up and then drops off. So in between doesn't show. It does show in between. It's the green, the red dots, I think, is the given fare. Well, it's moving really fast. I don't know why, but when when this big yellow dot is shown, that's when he's free. I see. So this is an example of how data that's made public by an agency can be used by someone else in software. Oh, 
no, the tax authorities can make use of this, right? Yeah. They know exactly how much <laughs> Only seven income he has. Yeah, okay. How is that tips like a money data? Where, did, where does that come from? Well, I, don't even, I don't know. Where did that it probably it's projects some, like there's an estimated. Well, well most, most cabs you pay for with your credit card, so in New York City. So they'll have that too. It has it too, yeah. That's an interesting additional piece of non-motion information that some people might be very interested in. <laughs> right, I mean, like, it's not really a motion. So here, uh, I'll show a few projects that I've done myself. This is what I call a three-in-one map. This is basically using the API's application production interfaces of Google Maps and Bing Maps to create an, just a small application that is very useful for my job. It's basically when I click anywhere on the Google Map, I get the street view and the Bing Maps aerial view because Bing Maps has very clear images. So instead of uh, going between two websites like this all the time, you can just get them at the same time. So we, I use this a lot, almost every day. So you can move through it and move on the windows. Something else that I've been working on is this detour visualizer. It's an application that I'm developing to store detours during construction and be able to use them later when the same, let's say, closure is needed. So if I zoom in, the yellow flags represent exits on this highway and when I click here it gives me the detour that was planned already. Except it's not a very nice color. I put the color on random but this uh, again I've added the same functionality. For example this can only be dragged with, on the line that represents the detour and we can get directions. If you close an exit it gives you an optimum Detour line. Right now it doesn't. <laughs> the detour is pre planned. But this is, and also uh, what I want to show you is the, uh, the database thing, the uh, concept. Once you store them somewhere, you can directly display them on the map. But what you also mentioned is, is possible to do. And another open data example this is all the well, this is the Montreal case, this is the Montreal transit uh, data. So if I click on one, I get where that bus passes from. And that's it. Uh, digitizing Aviator One's bus stops, that's something I did this month using the OpenStreetMap and Google Maps and collecting the bus data directly. And uh, the Aviator One's district, I didn't find a nice file to work with, so I, I made it myself an image by geo-referencing it. And as I mentioned before, freedom of information law is a law that many cities have that forces government to share data. And well, as we saw in the New York City example, it's a great example of what can be done. Excuse so, me, are the taxis required to carry that device? Uh, it's a GPS device. But they're required to? Or I, I mean, it depends on cities and companies, but in that case, I guess they were required. That's why I'm saying the privacy thing is happening, but no one seems to care anymore. Everyone's okay with invading their own privacy. <laughs> I know that many taxi yeah. services in the other one also install GPS models on the car so that they know where, how much they drive and then they know how much they make. Because taxi drivers tend to cheat on the owners. Yeah, that's one example of why it should be used. Or, or shouldn't. Or shouldn't. <laughs> well, on taxis, I guess, because taxi requires a permit from the city to work, then a part of that permit could be a requirement that you carry this kind of a transmitter. But uh, so the other possibility is that when before the data is made public, it's encrypted, so it's impossible to track who that let's say that ID address belongs to. Same thing with smart cards. When transit systems have smart cards, when they make the data public, to see person A goes from this stop to that stop, it's encrypted, you can't find out who it is. Um, uh, 
it's yeah, not supposed to. See, what, what I'm trying to say is that privacy applies to a person, private person who wants to go from A to B, but a taxi is not a private person. There's no privacy issue there. If you are going to be working as a taxi driver in a city, you need a permit, and a part of that permit, you lose your privacy. Part of that permit might be that you need to carry a device like this. But I think to make that data public, they can still anonymize Well, yeah, that's data. a different issue, right. yes. But the city knows who is who. <laughs> well, another good example of GPS equipped devices is buses, because some cities now have real time uh, schedules, or they have the schedule, preset schedule, where you get real time information of, oh, your bus is five minutes late, or it's going to be early, that you can check on a mobile application, for example. That's another use. So, how does, all, how does this all fit in? Well, my personal experience is that I learned programming and everything related to computers in my graduate school. In that school, they had a, like a really big emphasis on computer skills, which wasn't the case during the bachelor's. So basically, promoting the use of open source software as opposed to paying thousands of dollars for a software that does the same thing. And it forces you to learn as well. Use of open data, a lot of people don't know about open data. Some cities have websites dedicated only for data they share. And basically to include object-oriented programming in civil engineering curriculums in universities, which is not the case, at least not everywhere now. Okay, so I hope everyone didn't get bored with all the that was stuff. Exciting part. Now we're getting into the exciting part, exactly. Introducing bicycles as a mode of transport in the other analytic framework. So this is the framework prepared, understanding cycling demand and its growth by analyzing demographic and socioeconomic factors, determining current and forecasting future demand, use of surveys. I also de designed a survey the time I was here, but we didn't make it public, but it can always be used later. Asking questions like, how old people are? Uh, do they own a car or not? Do they have a bike? Do they rent one? What street they feel safe is traveling on, what street they feel unsafe traveling on, etc. Second a point is analyzing the infrastructure, the geometry of current roads. Is it possible to implement cycling lanes on those roads? Is there enough space? Is there visibility issues at the intersections? And then we move into analyzing traffic patterns. This is where the traffic engineering part comes in. So we need data on how many vehicles pass on a given street per day, uh, the origin des and destinations of people, and what uh, their route assignment, for example. And then again, road safety in the sense that the historic uh, accident data. If there's, there have been four deadly accidents on this intersection in the past year, then it's probably not the best idea to put a cycling lane there. Or the opposite, by putting the cycling lane there, you automatically change the geometry and make it safer, for example. Urban topography, challenges and solutions. We know that Yerevan has a lot of elevation differences, but there are examples in the world, such as San Francisco, who have successfully implemented a large cycling network. So we're going to talk about challenges and solutions. And then integrating all this into the other modes of transportation. So if, if I have a bike, but I can't do all of my trip with just a bike, then I want to be able to connect to another system. And all this ties into environmental policy and transportation plans and changing the trend of automobile dominance. So actually it's now so I phrase again, last phrase. Automobile dominance. That's my environmental contribution. <laughs> so cycling and society, what do people think about when they think about cycling? I don't know if anyone wants to give answers to this question. You, does anyone here have a bike? Do you bike regularly? Yeah, I did in San did. Francisco. Oh, oh, okay. Well, here are some common answers. The state of the roads, and how I would not dare ride on them, or not let my kids ride on them. Tour de France is something that comes to mind. That's Armstrong. Activity that is good for the planet. People are aware that cycling is a green activity, but doesn't necessarily mean that they do it. See bicycles carrying people to work. This makes us think of, I don't know, I guess old movies or Europe when people used to cycle.
cycle when the car has been dominating it. Mm -hmm. Adventures once in a lifetime sponsored rides for charitable cause. A lot of young people do this, even if they're not cyclists. They will decide one year I'm gonna do like this crazy hundred kilometer race to raise awareness for some disease. Slowly rusting machine somewhere in the back of the shed. We all probably have a bicycle at some point in our lives, but we'll stop using it. Hazard with cyclists present to other modes of mobility. Again, this comes from the automobile dominance, where people don't want to share the road anymore. Occasional good intentions of getting active. Fit and okay, go all of them. So now, cycling in society get in one case. Yes. You don't have um. You don't think that you know the bicycle is this kind of like hip new trend is also maybe one as well. Yes, that's actually the year one. Yes. Because, well, you see, there's a quote here. Well, I mean, where I come from, Montreal, is like the hipster capital. Yeah, of North yeah. America. I find that most cities that bicycling is like a really big thing. It's like a very, I don't know, it's trendy. Like cosmopolitan and trendy. Mm -hmm. So I found an article online, and there was a few quotes in it. And this one says, when police officers see bikers, they don't pick up loudspeakers to ask them to not disrupt traffic like they used to. This is in the case of the Erevan. This was said by a yoga instructor and cyclist. Again, drivers used to shout at bikers, they don't anymore. Said by a long time biker and champion in the Erevan. And this is where the trendy part comes in. This is from a store owner who sells bikes. Our customers are young people who have traveled abroad, seen various things, and changed their attitudes, which is what happened in Yerevan, and it's the trend that you mentioned. They have new outlook. So social changes are happening in Armenia. A mode of transport still is a portrayal of social class, but people are moving away from that ideology. And it's not only an activity for children anymore, it could be used for commuting and by adults. So in 2013, there was a 61% increase in bike imports only in one quarter. And apparently there was almost 15,000 bikes in 2013 in Yerevan, imported from the countries you see here. Okay, so now moving into the, the demand part of the, the framework. This is a map I made of using census data from 2011 that I got from the government website. We see that the most populated areas obviously are Kendron and to the, to the, I guess, to the west, if we want, of Yerevan. But population by itself doesn't say much. So we need to look at, oh, I forgot to mention. This is data from OpenStreetMap that I extracted and used in geographic software. But the Monte Mercunian Highway wasn't there, so I added it myself. So density, even though the western part was more populated. Gendron is obviously dense, and so is the northern part, which is where the major elevation difference is. So, which is sort of too bad. <coughs> Excuse me. Because <coughs> we went. associated with an area where anything would happen before it would happen in a less dense area and cycling would be one. But there's an elevation difference here, but we'll talk about the challenges and solutions later. Land use. Yerevan has a lot has very mixed land use, so basically I'm only showing here green areas, cemeteries and industrial areas. And here's one with the buildings just to see where the concentration is. There's a lot of buildings here, here, over here, and over here. You know, on public transportation, I don't know if it's visible, but every green dot is supposed to be a bus stop. And uh, the blue line with the purple dots is the metro station. I don't think you guys can see very well. Also, here, what I've done is I've removed the minor roads. 
And if you notice, all the bus stops that are shared by marshal cars and buses all pass on the same roads. <clears throat> oh. Here's a heat map. A heat map is uh, just an image representation of the density of something. So I've done this 500 meter heat map. So if there are bus stops, a lot of bus stops between, within 500 meters that show up, it shows up as red. This is a good thing because there's a lot of red. It means that you get on public transportation, at least by definition, is well because it has a lot of stops. It's well done. Traffic control devices, again, this is from OpenStreetMap data. The yellow dots are signals, traffic signals, which have been increasing. Here's in Yerevan, which makes it safer. And the yellow dots are uh, speed cameras. There's quite a few of them. Um, here's a heat map for the traffic signals. I put it at 250 meters because that's a minimum. You shouldn't have traffic signals at less than 250 meters because that just impedes the traffic a lot and people don't like it. But we see that it's okay because everything's in. Okay, altitudes. These are the lines showing the altitudes uh, within Yerevan, moving from 900 to 1400 meters. Um, so we the, the red area is over here, and it's well, if I put it the other way, we're going up as we go uh, northeast. So there is uh, almost too much difference. 200 meter difference elevation between Gendron and uh, the more populated dense areas. Cycling demand. So to determine the current demand, we can look at regional origin destination surveys. It happen every three or five years. There is none for Yerevan as of yet. Hoping that we should be one soon. Or a more specific cycling survey that I mentioned earlier. You can also create demand. By advocacy, this has nothing to do with uh, cycling, it's just how the government handles their uh, <clears throat> information and what they tell people. So at the country, city or NGO level, because this is, is also used as a, a measure of cyclability for a city, that's why I put it in there. Bicycle culture, which is starting in Yerevan. Uh, active lifestyle promotion, removal of cars from and parking from city centers. Educating the population on benefits of benefits of cycling and anticipating future demand. This is a, the complete streets concept is a relatively new concept. It's I'll just move on to the next slide. It's it's planning and designing new streets, having everything in mind instead of saying, okay, let's put three lanes on each side, and then 20 years down the line when it gets dense and people start bicycling or transit system develop. We'll think of it later. No, we, we should think of it right away. So in this picture, we see our green area, we see our cycling area, we see our pedestrian area. So this is an example of complete streets that could be used for new areas. Now we're going to get into just a few uh, bikeway designs. This, the most simple one is the conventional bike lane, which is just a strip on the side of the road. But there is, a, <clears throat> there is a small buffer here to prevent dooring, which is when cyclists run into an open door. That happens a lot in uh, cities. I'm sure New York, Montreal has that problem. So these are some real life examples. This one is from, I can't see on my screen. I can't see. Well, they're in the States. And this, this is in New York. This one is on the left. So having, having, for example, having the bikeway on the left side is to increase visibility because the, the cyclist and the driver are on the same side. Because most people, uh, well at least in most countries, the steering wheel is on the left side. So that's one advantage. Buffered bike lanes, this is the next best thing, next to the conventional one, is when we have a, a painted separation between the lanes and the bicycle lane, which makes it a little more safer. 
It's good for higher speeds when vehicles are traveling at higher speeds on a given road. And it's also good when we have large lanes because we can take a bit of space from the lanes. Yeah, it's the buffer. Contra flow bike lanes. This is when it's mostly used on one way streets, but it could be used <coughs> on two way streets as well. Because normally bikes run in the same direction as the vehicles, because it's safer, or just to flow, to continue the flow of the, the network. But we have contra flow lanes that means the bikes run opposite to the, to the vehicles, and this is good for connectivity because if anyone here has done any cycling, when you go, if you leave your house, go to your destination, you found the best route that's comfortable for you, you want to come back the same way. But if there, if there are any one-way roads, then you need to change your, your road design. So this makes it easier for people to use the same roads. Then we want to protect the cycle tracks. This is very popular. It's when we have uh, parking separating uh, moving vehicles and the cycle track. So we have a lane, we have a parking lane, we have a buffer, and we have the cycle track. It makes it much safer and it serves a higher percentage of cyclists. Let's say if you're not very experienced, you feel much safer in this kind of road. And the buffer can be anything from, from vegetation to other solid objects. Then we have raised cycle tracks. Um, <clears throat> it just increases the comfort by raising it, and it's also good for maintenance because since it's raised, vehicles don't use it. So there's no wear. The only wear is from the bicycles, so it lasts longer. It might be more expensive to implement, but it's easier to maintain. And then we get into two-way cycle tracks, which is pretty much <clears throat> what we saw already, but in two directions. Here's a good example of, of separating the motorized vehicle traffic from the bike lanes. We don't see any buffer, but since it's raised, it gives a pretty good uh, impression of it's separated. And here we are, I think this is in New York, cycle track running between two roadways. It's almost like going through a cycle, right? Sort of. Nice impression. Okay, now moving on to intersections. What we can do to make intersections safer. Uh, this is called a bike box. So what it does, it gives the priority to cyclists. For example, if it's a signalized intersection and you stop at a red light, the green area is for cyclists. So they'll be the first ones to leave when the light is green. So it facilitates right turns, like we see here, and left turns, like we see here. Two-stage turn view box. It's very similar to the bike box, but it, it increases visibility even more. So if you want to make a left turn, you go inside the intersection and wait here until it's clear for you to turn. So, so drivers that are coming in this direction, for example, will see you there. Cross markings, this is just to show that it's a good idea to put markings in the intersection. <coughs> to increase visibility, or if I'm a driver and I'm coming up to the intersection and I see paint on the floor, I'll be more likely to think that this, there's a cycle path that runs through here. I should be careful. Through bike lanes, this is when we have a, a right turn lane, but instead of the bikes having to yield to the vehicles, the bikes can keep going straight over here and then the, the vehicles have to yield to the bikes, like we see in this one. And this is the last slide on uh, design. It's uh, the ultimate intersection design. This is a Dutch design invented in the Netherlands. What it does, it puts physical barriers on all approaches. So if I want to make a right turn, for example, looking here, or going straight, I'm protected by this physical barrier and it gives uh, more visibility for the, the vehicles. And they can't, they, it's almost impossible to hit the cyclist because the vehicle has to go around the area. Another advantage of this is that you can have an all 
cyclist pays at intersections, meaning it's red for every car, for all directions, but the cyclists can go around. If they want to make a left turn, if they want to make a right turn, it's free for them. These are real-life examples. The barriers don't always have to be concrete blocks. This is a case in Montreal, where we have uh, the vertical posts. Again, in the, in the Netherlands, this is an elevated Basically, they, they turned the roundabout into an elevator cycle track, but this is an extreme case. So how do we decide what kind of facility we should use on what kind of road? This is one example. This is from a Dutch book. It's a function of length configuration, <coughs> average daily traffic, speed, etc. So we have a table here that we can follow. It doesn't necessarily apply to Yerevan, but it's an example. Okay. For the Yerevan case, so the opportunities are city cycling and touring. City cycling includes commuting and leisure, leisure riding, let's say in the green areas around Yerevan. And touring because we see now we see a lot of people on the highway shoulders throughout the city riding to touristic destinations. And uh, we have uh, big green, uh, green parks such as Aftanagiaki or Zernagabert, where, I mean, maybe not Zernagabert, but people can go and then ride. The challenges for Yerevan are topography and safety issues. So now I want to tie into the first part of the presentation of how information technologies and applications can be used as planning tools. So one example is this website called Cycle So it's already in Yerevan, so I can plan my route. And it will show me the elevation differences. And I can also uh, tweak it a little bit to get the information I want. So this is one. Let's go from Yerevan to Garden. <clears throat> go from Yerevan to Garden. Put A on Yerevan. Center. Where? I don't know exactly. It should be close. You should go close. The path that goes yeah, to the right. Just above the red is gone. Mm -hmm. Here? That's it. So we see we have a lot of high climbs here in the red section. It's not bad. It's only 500 climbs. It's just 500 <laughs> meters. Okay. It's no problem. So Alan is going to go there tomorrow if anyone wants to join. Yes. So this is available already. Yeah, this is available. This is this is just a website. What was the name? What was the name? Cycle route. Cycle route. Or route. Yeah. route. And evidently Google has integrated this into their directions maps. Mm -hmm. The bottom part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another one. Is map my right? This, in my opinion, is by far the most. Yes. I have a question. Uh, does it show just elevation or steepness? It shows the steepness. Steepness. Okay. You can set the values you want: seven percent, eight percent. Yeah. Show the yeah. okay. Map by right is a is a mobile application for GPS cycling. Is when you track your GPS. It's the most popular one, and it just so happens that a lot of people in Yerevan have already created tracks that they cycle, either regularly or once. So this is a good data source also analyzing mm -hmm. what routes people are using. Right? Because these people have probably tried out different routes. And this is the one they do. So if I click on one, I can see. Who's this kilometers, like 500? <coughs> what are these numbers? Yeah, these are, this is the distance. In kilometers. Um, it's called Map My Run? Or Map My Ride. Map my ride. It, you can also run with that application. As long as you have a GPS. Uh, yeah, so sure. all you do is click your beginning and your end, yeah. and it records anything in between. It you can plan beforehand, in which case it draws a line that you follow. Or you can just say on, and it will draw the line as you move. Okay. 
solutions, possible solutions, bike racks on other modes of transportation, most commonly buses that are used in some cities throughout the world. Uh, the first picture is from the US. Most racks in the front fit two or three buses, uh, uh, bicycles. The second picture is from Germany, where it's in the back. So let's say if I live in a suburb and a bus connects to, let's say, to downtown, not the downtown core, but the central city, and I don't want to bike all that way, or in the Erevan's case, if there's an elevation difference, I can put my bike on the bus, get on the bus, get off and cycle the rest of the way, and do the same thing on the way back. And some people have come up with more creative solutions. This is a device in Norway. It works with a card and it requires a lot of balance. It's on a loop. What it does is there's this, this uh, there's a track, like a rail track, with a piece of metal that you put your foot on. And that metal, uh, that thing keeps moving forward and pushes you up. So you balance with your body and with one leg on the pedal. This is a picture from behind. So this is, I mean, it's, it's, it's a possibility of solving the equation. Okay, now coming to San Francisco. This is the map, the walking and cycling map of San Francisco. I know you can't see very well, but the point is that you see a lot of different colors. And what those colors mean is the slope. So, let's say if Yerevan were to produce a similar map, then people can plan their, their cycling activity without having to always use the internet, for example. Previous work done on cycling. Kanachastan NGO did some research in 2012 and they wrote a report. They addressed common problems and opinions, such as the safety and the elevation. They also talked about the design a little bit, but they primarily focused on uh, cycling in green areas. And they proposed a few routes for it. There was one cycle path that was implemented in the Oratsev IG, but it's not there anymore. For example, this is Haftangi Agi. <coughs> there was a lot of this in the report. Do they plant cycle tracks in green, big green areas? They were soon not even showing the, some thoroughfares. Okay, so how we would apply all of this in the Elon case? So the first thing would be the demand. So what so if I decide that, you know. A cycle path would be great between this area and that area. Let me draw it up. But I need to understand what the demand is. And we can get that from origin destination surveys or more uh, specific surveys. Then we look at the infrastructure. Width of the roads, total spaces available, available. lanes, width of sidewalks. Because the other one has a lot of large, uh, I mean, wide streets. But most of the width is allocated to pedestrian areas which is not bad, you just have to take maybe a few meters from that. Are there visibility issues at intersections? Uh, the major streets in Yerevan have humongous interse intersections that makes it that there are no, I mean, at first sight there is no issue with visibility, but there's other safety issues, like the drivers who are not, uh, yeah, I think, I don't think I'm aware of something. They're not aware of something. Let's put it in context. There's probably less accidents per thousand drivers in Yerevan than. I was tempted to put a video from India or Iran showing intersections where anything you can think of passes through and there's not one accident. And similar, Yerevan is similar to that. But I mean, you have, it's easy to say that there are many accidents, but we won't. Uh, we're not sure if there's any data. Maybe it's not uh, recorded or documented. Then we move on to traffic. So what are the, those maps I was showing first? We would require another map showing the posted speed, just to give an idea if, where are we at 40 kilometers an hour, 50 kilometers an hour, et cetera. Uh, what is the average annual daily traffic? How many cars pass per day on average? 
and what's the average value for it in the summertime. And then we would meet traffic counts at intersections, showing all movements, vehicles going through, turning right, turning left. And we would not need to know the right turn percentage because the deadliest, I mean, most deadly accidents involving bikes are at intersections and a very high percentage of them involve trucks. That's right turn? Right turn. And we need to look at the history of collisions and accidents and where they occur. And then we will move on to topography and integration of other modes. Okay, so uh, to finish, um, from the Ghana Chestnut Report, it was written in words, so they had written a psychopath should pass through here, through here, through here. I, I took that, I put it on a map, shown here by the orange line. I also included the traffic signals in the yellow. And that's, that's from Europe uh, Moss, pretty much from Gaibishde to the 7th grade. It goes to Madan Adaram. Yeah, so here we can just get an idea of <clears throat> if we want to connect to metro station, for example, can we do it? Let's say if this were to extend much, much lower, at some point I would want to connect to the metro station. Is it possible? Uh, buses, as of now, they're not large enough to have bike racks on them, but one, maybe one day they will. Uh, traffic signals. If I keep going on this road, how many times am I going to have to stop? If there are minor streets parallel to major streets with no traffic signals on them, then it's probably a good idea to divert the cycling traffic on those minor streets. And in this case, they use UC sign Road as a, as a road where bikes are supposed to pass. Um, I don't know if people are welcoming to that. Maybe the bicycle will just have to go around UC sign, and UC sign should remain a pedestrian on the road, for example. These are just examples. There need to be a lot more detailed analysis to come up with conclusions. So to conclude, I've written down some of the things that are, I think should be done in the near future. Campaigns to teach people how to ride a bicycle. If these can be free, they can be on weekends during the summers. Or I think it already happens, but you have to pay for it. Campaign to raise awareness of sharing the streets, uh, how to drive safely. Your driver or a cyclist. GTFS files for Yale on public transport. GTFS is just a, well, it stands for General Transit Speed Specification, which is uh, the database of bus routes that are sent to Google, that Google puts on their online map service. So, in, for example, in other cities, when you go give me directions from point A to point B, you have the transit option. And that's because of these files. And they're open data files. So once they're created, developers can make mobile applications for them, for example. Data collection plan and implementation, traffic counts, uh, classified counts, as in uh, separating taxis from buses, from transit vehicles, from passenger vehicles, transit ridership. I know that there's a general estimate of transit ridership because of the, the money that's collected in the, in the buses. But there's no information on if someone gets on a stop, on the first stop, and let's say gets off one stop later, then it's almost as if he didn't use the service at all. So it would be nice to have more detailed data. Speed data with uh, lasers that the cops use or other collection devices get speed data at uh, intersections or other parts of the road, and then some traffic impact studies with all this information. And then we can move on into planning for the mode of transportation. And that's it. Here are some of the references I used. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions. Two questions. <clears throat> First, can you take bike on the metro here? I don't know about that, but in most cities, you're not allowed to take your metro during rush hours. And off-peak hours, you can only use them in the first part, for example. 
But for for Yevon's case, I don't know, but I think it's something that can be arranged. It would be very helpful. Yeah. There are safety issues to handle there, but they've handled it in some cities. Second question. Do you know about uh, critical mass movement? Can you talk about that? Critical mass movement. Well, I think it started in San Francisco. Okay. Where bikers would select a time, and hundreds of them would gather and travel in the street, essentially stop okay. car traffic. And this is how they forced the city to plan bike lanes. And then this movement picked up uh, in other cities. Uh, a few years ago, I was, two years ago, I was in Prague, and there was critical mass that day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, I participated in it. So it's, it's a way of forcing cities to do something about bike roads. For the other one, I don't know if there's a critical mass movement. But uh, there are a lot of groups on social media, on Facebook, where very enthusiastic people about cycling. Uh, these groups, their membership ranges from 200 to 2,000 people. And there's even a group called Night Riding. And from the pictures that I've seen on that page, it's not maybe critical mass, but it's a lot of people who ride together at night. But uh, we have a cyclist here in the, in the audience, so maybe he can enlighten us. Go ahead. We yeah, actually uh, participated in uh, quite a number of uh, like events like that, but we never had the idea like using this uh, collection uh, and power to force the municipality to build the bike route, but it could be used. I think it's a nice idea. I think if you go on Google, you'll find uh, material. <laughs> yes. As uh, far as I understand, the uh, cycling lines should be designed uh, in, in pedestrian area, right? In what area? In pedestrian area. Pedestrian area or street area? Not necessarily. It depends on the low Well, okay. But most of the time, yes. Yeah. <coughs> uh, uh, so which means that there is a um, lot of reconstruction. Mm -hmm. for, for, for the city. Why the city municipality should allocate funds for huge reconstruction? I mean, there's quite a few answers to that. One of them is the environmental benefits or health benefits, active lifestyle cycling. The other one is, I'm sorry to say, Yerevan thinks it has a congestion problem, but it's nothing compared to the larger cities. I think it can be easily fixed with uh, optimizing traffic signals or uh, tweaking the transit network or even controlling the, I mean, I don't want to piss off anyone, but controlling the, the taxi companies. There are, in some hours, there are more taxis than anything else on the, on the road. And not all of them are used. There are, the answer to your question is that I think there's a lot of work to be done first even before thinking of going to the municipality and saying, hey, you should give us our cycle paths. Just also from an environmentalist point of view, I would say um, the sacrifice should not be from the pedestrian areas. They should be from the, um, the, the pass of the automobile, the road. Uh, I, mean, it's a, I mean, the advantage we have in Yerevan is that is that we still don't have, like in most North American countries, we don't have the private passenger automobiles being a huge and kind of immovable political force. We still, it's still emerging. So it's a, there's an opportunity to try to get the right policies in place where the road is, sh is actually, the private passenger automobile is managed in a better way. Because I don't think the sacrifice should come from the pedestrian, it should come from the, the private passenger automobile. Yes. Um, do you think that uh, electric bikes are a game changer in transportation, specifically, not specifically in Yerevan, but around the world? Um, I think electric bikes aren't all that popular, and they've been 
people are coming up with new technologies. Now they have self-shifting gears. They have assisted. It's some magnets battery or something. It's, it's much lighter than an electric motor. That can Talking about like not like the little electric like you know, buzz bikes, but the new the new generation of like electric assisted bicycles that are basically regular bicycles with a battery inside. And I know that's a technology that's gaining momentum at least in the states, yeah. and it's gonna I think explode in terms of revolutionizing bicycle transportation in cities with elevation problem. Definitely, um, but I don't know if you knew anything about. It. You, uh, I mean, uh, there was a competition won recently by someone in the US who designed a bike like that. Well, I can't remember what city it was from. I will show you right now, but it's just not coming. But uh, I think there's a future. Definitely. I think just recently a company in Arkham Yerevan brought uh, these electric assisted bikes and they're just giving it for rent. And they're quite popular. I see yeah. uh, which a number. Of, uh, it's just electric bike that AM. Uh, if you just search it on Facebook, you will find it. They have it improved, and that's a future. Yes. Uh, you spoke about uh, different data sources in assisting data collection. Uh, did you consider or interact with municipality who try to? Uh, Established this uh, automated bus stops, this data. I am not sure whether this system is working, but uh, as far as I know, the database is on for the last year at least, and okay. they already collected huge. I did uh, talk to Ms. Valley the month that I was here. I know there are some vehicles that have GPS on them, and at the bus stops we did a screen yeah. that shows the real thing. Yeah, I did get a my time was, was a little short, but I would love. I think the issue there, and it seems like they're collecting the data and all these kinds of movements. Uh, from what we gather, we may be wrong, but we were talking about this. It seems like it's mostly for the transportation planners and not the consumers of transportation services. So it's still, the data is being collected somewhere. We don't know what happens to it. At the consumer level, it's not being served in a, in a useful way for consumers to be able to use it. It may need mobile apps, it may need something to, to get it more useful for, for the transportation service consumers. I did email the municipality, but much, much, uh, I mean, just a few days ago. So. And it, I guess it wasn't the best time to contact all this. But uh, that would be very interesting. If there's data that already exists. I mean, if there's a CIS master's project that can happen, I mean, it's a perfect project to support. Well, we had well, we some students last year. Yes, people yeah. are involved in this project and they created the database. So, why? Not just the database. Not just the but the entire application, in fact, mm -hmm. was created here. But not here, but with our students. The first thing that should be done is the if there's work in that direction already, then we actually need to get the Google files to Google so people can know which bus they're supposed to take. Because, I mean, there, I haven't seen a single map, PDF or printed, showing where the buses pass from, or even the most routes. The routes. Route 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 Maybe you should contact the it also shouldn't be that difficult to get. <laughs> but, I mean, I think, but I think you're underscoring a point here that, that, that like, what should be done is, you know, comes from this like, the push pull, right? I mean, there needs to be demand by a consumer or many consumers or all consumers. Or, right? I mean, I think some of that sort of uh, you know, generation of that demand or identification. But there's, if I could just before you say your next statement, there's also a nuance there is that. Consumers may not know what they could have. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's what I was getting to. So I think, like, it's, it's part of it is the, like, what's called sophistication or knowledge or cognizance of the marketplace. And maybe, in like Armin's example, when we talk about critical mass, there's a concept, there's a, there's a philosophical concept there. And that is, we need a critical mass of whatever to cause change. Now, if, if some of that 
data exists, but it's like, let's say, for lack of a better word, it's sitting there, and no one's working on it. Uh, you know, maybe what's needed is a bit of a PR effort. Maybe what's needed is a bit of a, you know, a monetization scheme, so that some startup company can say, hey, if we create X, you know, we, we can, you know, there, there's a business opportunity here. I mean, I think in general, municipalities in general are typically not the most, you know, um, sort of low inertia, highly adaptable, you know, quick to pounce kind of uh, entities in this world. You know, typically these are kind of startups or private sector or just people with the time or inclination or passion, uh, hunger uh, to do it. So I think, I think uh, you know, maybe that's all happening and I mean, none of us here know it or maybe some people here are actually doing this, but I think, uh, you know, at least connecting up some of the people who know about this or who are involved in one way or another. Because there's actually like a whole ecosystem, right? I mean, someone might be really involved purely from a safety standpoint or purely from a gas efficiency or, you know, that's like, you know, who knows what, like different vantage points here may not be so interested in other aspects of this, but they, they do, whether they know it or not, form some kind of ecosystem. And I think uh, maybe Facebook helps here, maybe just connecting up some people that we just mentioned who are doing this works here. And, and, and obviously, you, you look like you're at the sort of uh, fulcrum or, or hub of a lot of this uh, yourself. And so we we'll take a lot of that coalescence of, of data and information that's already even in this, even in this uh, presentation. So I think, I think it's just, to me, it's all good news. And, and I bet there's a lot of good stuff happening that maybe we don't even know about. And maybe by creating like a buzz, information can come to us. So if we, if we kind of like put it so that people let us know what we're doing. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned that uh, bicycle truck in all of this part. Yes. What happened to it? Uh, well, if I'm not mistaken, the pedestrian area there is sort of cobblestone, and what happened is they painted the lines, and there was an opening ceremony, and uh, I don't know what happened. The paint disintegrated. Sorry? The paint disintegrated. The paint disintegrated. Okay, part of the bad paint was super scarce. So I don't know how to provide that, but the mom came by. Yeah, that was just a, was, I think it was the first step, first trial. So you know, you know when he answers like that, he works in the Ministry of Transportation. He's just so careful not to offend anyone. Yeah. Well, I have one that I don't know if you can answer anybody here. Is it is it true that the uh, public transportation here is somewhat not public? It's actually privatized by certain routes that are owned by certain people? Because it seems to me, just as an observer, that there's absolutely no cohesion between even things on the same route with the same number could be different types of vehicles, nothing is marked the same. I mean, it's the most confusing system I've ever seen in any country. And I think one of the steps to getting the municipality or transportation agency to be effective is to actually figure out what they have power over and what they do not. Um, so I don't know. I is talking about this with quite a few people. Does anybody control any of uh, The marshal, because at least they're all private. They're run by like 13 companies or something, or more. Uh, the lines are concessions, or they're actually forever owned by I don't know. It's explained a little bit on the municipality website. Like, the municipality has something to do with it, but after that, uh, maybe they plan it, and then it's privately operated, which is fine, because that happens in other cities. But in this case, it's a little more. I think the big buses are municipality owned. Right? Maybe, but yeah. what you say is, is true. In the different forms of public transport can compete against each other, and this was also written in a report that I found that was done in 2010 for Yerevan. So yeah, there is no cohesion. Every vehicle runs from the same road. They all pass from the same stop. But the other the other end of this is that. When you get on Marshinska, 
supposed to be in public service, but when you leave your house, you walk to the first, uh, the closest stop, you get on the vehicle, and then you go to your destination directly. No transfers, no nothing. Which is, well, I mean, theoretically, it's not supposed to be that way, but it's convenient. It, I think it can be changed a little bit. It needs to be a sweet spot. It's as if the martial class don't know that the buses exist. And the buses don't know that the martial class exists. And the taxi is useful. Yeah, everyone, everyone has is in their own world. There's no... Uh, as a user of the system, I'm very happy. Hmm? As a user of the system, I'm yeah. very happy. As a user, it's yeah. cheap. Yeah, I guess it is cheaper. But I mean, uh, I don't know. I Coming from a New York system, absolutely everything is centralized. and it's. Absolute perfect, it, though it is expensive. I mean, like being in New York for two days, I could operate the entire system with no problem, like with no maps. I'm mean, like, it's very logical. All the routes go where they say to go. Whereas here, it's like I'm just asking the driver, like, hey, do you go here? No, I'll hop in. Maybe not. Even the locals ask the driver. Yeah. But it's a weird comparison. I mean, you're comparing a city twenty times size of another, the richest country on earth, you know, you know, a system that has hundreds of years of urban, ur of urban and public transportation history with, with, I mean, it's a weird comparison. Right, I'm just comparing the, the extreme formal with the extreme informal. I, I'm not saying that, you know, we have all this. I think what he's also saying is when you get in the metro, you feel good because you know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah, you're going to get off at this stop and you're going to be there because you know you're there. David, uh, the comparison wasn't a good idea, but I, I think the, f the first uh, thing is the information, lack of information. Once we get the information out of the depot, then we can see if it's a more optimal way of doing things. But uh, using the comparison thing again, for a city the size of Yerevan, Having 76 official Marshall Guard routes, plus, I don't know, another 20, 30 in that run that don't pass to the end one, plus having, uh, I don't know how many bus routes there are, but there are quite a few. It's, it's, it's a lot. So, what's next for you? You're going to return tomorrow, you said? Yeah. Well, not on that. I was going to work on airplane. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, are there projects or things that you foresee in terms of collaborative possibilities? Or Yeah, definitely. I mean, this, the data collection is one thing that I think is, is, is a good direction to go into. The other one would be transit information, for example, what we talked about.